All right, good evening, good morning, whenever you happen to be watching this video. I am uh, Pastor Aaron Maddox. I'm the assistant pastor at Biker Church of the Heartland. And this is session three of Christian Counseling. Um, last, last week we did a lot of kind of historical background of counseling and where, where counseling kind of began and where Christian counseling was the primary means of counseling across the board. Um, but into the late 19th, early 20th centuries, new emergence of psychology and psychiatry started coming out with more secular versions of, of therapy and more secular versions of, of mental health, uh, mental health wellness, mental health, how to treat mental health. And there began a divide because the psychiatrists and psychologists, they were describing the human psyche completely separate, completely separate from the idea of man having a soul, from us being spiritual beings. They were trying to define man's man's soul as a secular part of his anatomy almost like like an appendage it was like a like an appendix that we can go in and fix um, and that's how they tried to describe it and that's how they tried to approach it a very humanistic approach that man has the wisdom and knowledge and understanding that we can fix these problems ourselves uh, we don't rely on a higher power man has the ability within himself that's kind of the whole idea of of humanism is that man is good enough strong enough smart enough on his own that we don't need a deity we don't need a god so we're going to kind of talk about that just a little bit more here at the beginning. I'm not going to dwell on it. We talked about that quite a bit uh, last week. And we talked about the requirements for something to be considered biblical counseling. We're going to talk about that a little bit here right at the beginning. And then we're going to get into the practical how-to of counseling. Um, how you go about counseling, how you, how you, format, how you format your counseling sessions. Uh, that's what we're going to cover in this session, next session, and then the fifth session. Uh, next to the last session, we're going to talk about that a little bit more, just kind of the, the how-tos of counseling. Um, a lot of what I say today, I think a lot of the stuff that I talked about last week was, was, was gospel. Like it, it, is, it is strict and hard rules. If, it doesn't, if you don't use the Bible as the basis for your counseling, don't call it biblical counseling. It's not. If you're not relying on the Holy Spirit as guidance for your counseling, don't call it biblical counseling because it's not because the Bible commands that we use the Holy Spirit when we counsel people. He is the wisdom that we call on to help us counsel people. We don't, we have the ability through the word of God and through the Holy Spirit. That's how we have the ability to counsel people. It's not through our own wisdom. That goes back to humanism that we try to get away from. We want to stay, uh, we want to stay based on the, the rock solid foundation of God's word and the Holy Spirit. He is going to be how we go about counseling people. Uh, but so some of the stuff we talk about today I, aren't, aren't those two non-debatable points. Some of the stuff I talk about today, there's room for debate, and I'm totally okay with that. A lot of this comes from my own experience. Um, people much wiser and smarter than me on counseling people, and there are vast numbers of those people. Um, but I just want to talk a little bit more about these two requirements that I talked about, the Holy Spirit and using the Bible. Of course, counseling that does not use biblical principles cannot be biblical counseling. Duh. It says it in its name. It's biblical counseling, so it's Bible-based. I've heard a lot of people tell me some non, very non-biblical things that Christian counselors have told them. Any advice that you are giving should be weighed against the, wor should be weighed against the Word of God. I don't care. I don't care if I said it. I don't care if Chris said it. I don't care if Pastor Heath said it. Pastor Herb said it. I have immense respect for all those people. But still, the standard at which I judge everything is the Word of God. And it takes authority over any person, over any advice, over any wisdom, any, over any experience. Anything else that comes into my life has to come under the Word of God. That is my standard. And anything that doesn't pass the test of the Word of God, I'm getting rid of it. I don't care how good it sounds. I don't care how much I, I like the person that told me that. I don't care how much I value their opinion. If it doesn't line up to the Word of God, I don't want to take that into my life and then build and structure part of my life based on something that doesn't line up to the Word of God. That's critical. Uh, there are a lot of counselors who use secular theology mixed with Scripture and call it Christian counseling. It's not. You see that more and more that... I talk about people get up and they give like a, like a TED talk, an inspirational talk, an inspirational message, encouraging you to go out and be your best and to try your hardest and all these other things. And then they tag a couple of scriptures onto the bottom and all of a sudden they call that biblical counsel and it's not. Biblical counsel comes straight from the word of God, comes straight from the voice of the Holy Spirit. And it always comes with power and authority. And you can tell the difference uh, between human secular counseling and biblical counseling by the authority that comes with it. When God speaks to a spirit-filled person, 
just like I was talking about with the song this morning, even things I know, when I hear them again and God says, are you getting this? Changes things. So if I have somebody that I'm counseling with that, is, that, is giving, that I'm getting counseling from that is giving me wisdom and knowledge from the Holy Spirit, wisdom and knowledge from God, even things I know now hit me like a ton of bricks. All of a sudden now these things have more weight and more impact. And I go, I know that, but I'm not applying that. I'm not doing that in my life. But again, that, you don't get that from humanist, humanist secular um, therapy. You get that from the Word of God and the power that comes with the Word of God. Uh, all, the, all the counselors I know at Heartland, all the pastors that I know that do, that do counseling, do biblical counseling. They rely on the Word of God. They pray about it. They rely on the Holy Spirit. And none of them would have any problems if the person they were counseling said, wait a minute, can, how does that line up with Scripture? They would be more than happy to explain how what they're, what they're advising you to do lines up with Scripture. If you go to a, a Christian counselor who's not willing to do that or doesn't want to do that, don't walk out of there, run out of there. That's not biblical counseling, and that's not influence that you want to put into your life. I, I've, like I said, I have friends who I consider wise. I value their opinion, uh, but none of them compare to the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. You can combine them. You can even multiply them. It's still not even close. We're going to go through some verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to go through verses 10 through 15 with a little intermixed commentary. Um, this is kind of the, the basis for a lot of the, the how-to or the whys of, of counseling with the, with the Holy Spirit. We're going to start in verse 10. It says, These are the things God has revealed to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. Verse 11 is, the, is critical here. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. No one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. So when we rely on the Holy Spirit, we are tapping into the thoughts of God. What are God's thoughts in my situations? And as a Christian, that should be our, our first and foremost question in any situation that we're struggling in is, what are God's thoughts on my situation? What does God think about the things that are going on? What does God think about the problems in my family? What does God think about the trouble in my marriage? What does God think about this? What's his opinion? And... It's so hard. We talked about last week that a lot of times a person that's, that's, that's looking for counseling, wanting counseling, they feel like they're drowning. We feel like we're underwater, that the stresses and the pressure of life just surround us, and it's all we can think about is the water around us. We need something from the outside to reach in and grab us up. That's what we try to be as a counselor, but we, we aren't the Savior. We aren't the one that saves people. We tap into the power of the Holy Spirit. We tap into God, and we use His wisdom and knowledge to save people. But we can be that arm reaching down to grab hold of them and help them up out of the water. But it's when we start taking the credit as our credit instead of giving that credit to God that He's the one that's actually doing the work. We may be the one that's being an intercessor. I like to think of it as a conduit. Uh, if you know anything about electrical, you feed electrical wires through conduit. The conduit does nothing but deliver the wires. With it, you could put all the conduit in the world, but if you never ran a wire through them, you don't get any power anywhere. We're the conduit. We, condu we are the conduit that God uses to bring his power into situations that people face. That's the role of the counselor is to be that conduit. Uh, counseling without the Spirit of God is relying on your thoughts and not God's thoughts or relying on someone else's thoughts other than God's thoughts. Getting second opinions when you are counseling people is a great idea. Go to people who have more experience with, than you. And this is the idea we talked about last week of going up or down the spiritual chain. When, we're looking for, when we are looking for people to, uh, to get second opinions, to get their thoughts into when we're counseling someone, we always go up the spiritual chain, not down the spiritual chain. There can, be people, there can be people with less spiritual maturity than you that have insight, that have wisdom and have knowledge, but it's always best to go up that chain. Go to people that have been counseling longer. Go to people that have been Christians longer. Go to people with a stronger relationship with God than what you have. And again, that's the way that we keep going up that chain. We keep strengthening that chain by building on the, on the stronger links above us and encouraging people below us to do the same. We build that, that spiritual chain that makes churches powerful things. That's how God uses, that's how God uses churches is it, it builds a chain between him and lost people. That's what the church is. We're building a chain of people connecting God to the lost people of the world. We... Uh, Go to people that have, that have counseled similar problems before. Get people to pray for wisdom and discernment for the situation. Always talk to the person you are counseling before you go to someone for second opinion or advice. And 
a lot of times when you're counseling people, you're dealing with some things that are very personal to them. And for them to find out that you went and talked to somebody else about it, even if it's a good source, even if it's somebody whose opinion they would value, when they find out that you did that without talking to them first, that and letting them know that you were going to share those things can be very damaging to the relationship. And we're going to talk today about how important it is to build that relationship with the people you're counseling. And doing something like sharing their, sharing their, their struggles uh, can be very damaging to that relationship, especially if you do that very early on in your counseling with them. Verse 12 says, What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. So counseling that is not from the spirit of God is from where? According to this verse, counseling that is not from the spirit of God is from the spirit of the world. And that goes right back to, we talk about that mountain of secular thought, secular therapy, secular um, therapy sessions that this world is just full of. All these things that are dragging people away from tapping into God as the source of their healing, the source of their, God's their therapist. That's, that, that would be the ideal scenario. So we put little counselors in place that are the go-between, the conduit, so that God is their counselor. The Holy Spirit is the one doing the counseling. We are just the human manifestation that's there to, um, to aid that process. Verse 13, this is what we speak, not in words taught to us by human wisdom, but in words taught to us by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. When you hear Spirit-taught words here, we're not talking about speaking in tongues. We're talking about speaking into someone's life when you're counseling them. We want to speak what the Holy Spirit is speaking. I always say that when, when we preach. When, if, you, if, if you preach at a church... You want God directly speaking through you. I love when you get done with a sermon and somebody says, man, it was really good. You said this, this, and this. And I'm like, man, I don't even remember saying that. But when you submit yourself to God, when you submit yourself to God as a preacher or as a therapist, God is going to speak through you in a supernatural way. You are going to speak with wisdom well beyond your abilities. At Biker Church, we say all the time, God makes us look good. Because when we step out on our own, often we, we show our rear ends. We don't look very good but God makes us look good. When we submit to him, he makes us look good. He makes us look knowledgeable. And then we pass all that glory back to him. That it's not, a, it's not me, it's not what I do, it's what he does. And I am humbled that he uses me. When we speak into someone's life and we are counseling with them, we want to speak, the Holy Spirit is speaking to their situations. All things align when it's from God. The Holy Spirit will never speak something that doesn't align with the Bible. And the Bible will never say something contradictory to the Holy Spirit. If you hear something that you believe is from the Holy Spirit, but you're reading in the Bible and it's not lining up, you need to recheck what you're hearing. God, is, God will always confirm. You always feel like, I can't, question, I can't question God. If I feel like God said something, I just need to shut my mouth and do it. But you look through the Bible and so often, uh, David especially, David questioned God quite a lot. He wanted God to confirm what he was telling him to do. And when he asked, God would confirm for him. He'll do the same for you. If you, if you think you're hearing something from God and you're praying about it, but you seem to see some scripture that, that would disagree with that, then pray and ask God again. Ask him to confirm that what you're hearing is correct. Verse 14. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. And this presents a really interesting question because... Very often, I think there are secular people that are seeking out counseling from Christian and biblical counselors. They get referred there by a friend. Um, they try other counseling, and it doesn't necessarily work. It doesn't get the results that they want. And they are looking for another option. And a lot of times, they will come to a church and ask for counseling, even though they don't have that faith in God. So it says, the person without the Spirit of God can't understand it. They view Christian counseling as foolishness if they don't have the Spirit of God in them. So how, then how do you go about counseling someone that isn't necessarily a Christian if, if you do Christian and biblical counseling? And my opinion of that is you counsel them exactly like you would a believer. And you fully believe and you pray that the Holy Spirit is going to work on your end to work with your words, and he's going to work on them for their understanding. When you're counseling somebody that is not, that is not necessarily a believer, you might have to explain Christian ideas, Christian terminology to them to help them understand what you're talking about. So things like sanctification, things like righteousness, uh, things like the fallen nature of man that's so important in counseling is understanding that, that man's nature is not good. The humanistic approach we talked about last week is that man by nature is good. 
God says man by nature is evil. Man by nature is destructive. And that only through God, only through, the, only through our faith in his son, do we become something good. But you might have to explain that to someone that's used to hearing secular theology that man is good on his own. But even truths of the Bible are universal truths, not just for believers. I'm going to read a verse out of 2 Timothy 3.16. We actually read this last week. It says, All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. We said that's the basis of what Christian counseling is. There's absolutely no text in there that says that's only for believers. It's only, it's only good for believers. Truth is truth, no matter where truth comes from. And I believe all truth comes from God. So often people are most open to God when they're struggling and they're looking for help in, 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 a, in a direction in their life. So by applying biblical principles to them, you don't approach counseling like it's evangelizing. Um, I, I say that people are probably the most, you talk about a foxhole Christian, somebody that under, under tremendous stress, under tremendous pressure and tremendous fear is when they came to God. And a lot of times in counseling, it's, it's an open door that people are more willing to hear stuff like that. But don't start treating your counseling sessions like, like you're evangelizing to somebody. The Holy Spirit, let the Holy Spirit lead and guide and direct. It's like, it's like don't try to evangelize to them when they're, when they're starving to death. Give them some food. Help, be helpful. Be a counselor first and an evangelizer second. And I believe that when God opens doors, when they see the power of Christian counseling, then you can introduce them to where that power comes from. But don't think of your counseling sessions with a non-believer as an evangelizing opportunity at the front end. Verse 15 says, The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. A counselor relying on the Holy Spirit can offer counsel about all things because they are not relying on on human discernment, but godly discernment. They're not relying on their own knowledge, the limit of their own knowledge when they do, check, do counseling. Biblical wisdom works on a natural level. This is such a cool thing with the Bible. Scriptures work on so many multiple levels. And when Jesus would speak, when you read Jesus' words, it's like he's operating on three or four levels at the same time. What he's saying can pertain to so many different situations. He talked about things in his culture at the time. He talked about prophetic things that were going to happen in the future. He talked about things in the past from the Old Testament. And he did it all in the same time when he was, when he was, when he was speaking. It, he had an amazing ability to do that. But the Bible has an amazing ability that it can deal with. You know, people say it's, it's a 2,000-year-old book. How, how can that pertain to my life today? It doesn't even... But the Bible has an amazing ability to deal with things on the natural. The Bible is so full of great advice, great practical marriage advice, great practical parenting advice, great practical uh, financial advice is found in the Bible. And it doesn't matter that it was written 2,000 years ago. It still fits so well into the things that we're dealing with today. But it also deals with things on, on a spiritual level. The Bible talks about how we deal with... with um, how we deal with spirits. People get spirits on them. How we deal with spirits that are controlling spirits or, or prideful spirits or, re, or rebellious spirits or angry spirits. How we deal with those spirits. And in Christian counseling, you're, gonna, you're going to deal with things on the natural side of what people are going through and you're going to deal with things on the supernatural side that people are going through. I said in the first session, not very often have I ever seen a situation in anybody's life that didn't have a spiritual component to it. Um, and that's part of the reason why the human secularism therapy fails is because human secular therapy cannot address spiritual problems. Praise God, the Bible and the Holy Spirit can. I want to read one last scripture before we move on. I'm kind of hammering the Holy Spirit point, but I really want you to get that. If you don't, if you don't get anything else from these classes, uh, get and understand that, that biblical counseling, Christian counseling, has to rely solely on the Bible and the, the inspiration, the 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 power from the Holy Spirit. That's the only way that we do biblical counseling. And with the Spirit of God, you have everything you need to be a counselor. It says that we are, we are well equipped for every good task when we rely on Scripture and the Spirit of God. But in Isaiah 30, verse 1, it says, Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, who take counsel, but not of, not of me, and devise plans, but not by my Spirit, for they may add sin to sin. So he says, Woe to the rebellious children. He's giving them a warning. Taking or giving counsel that is not of God and not passed through the Spirit of God opens us up to a sin. Uh, at its very core, base level, sin is disobedience to God. Not doing what God instructs is sin. 
So when we are, when we are relying on secular people, secular ideology, there's no way we're going to get instruction from God from that. There's no way that a secular person can give us instruction from the Word of God. So by going to secular counsel, we are setting ourselves up to sin against God in situations where we aren't being obedient to Him because we're not getting advice from Him. And very often, the only time a Christian goes and gets counseling outside of Christian counseling is when God already told them what to do, and they don't like that. I don't like what God told me to do, so I am going to go elsewhere. And I'm going to get in a second, a second opinion, if you can imagine getting a second opinion from God. Uh, but he says, so um, at its most basic, sin is disobedience to God. Uh, we only offer counsel. Oh, this is a good one, too. This, this is after you've been counseling for a while. We only offer counsel that is not of God out of rebellion and pride. Again, when we start feeling like it is our wisdom, our knowledge, all our successes, how good we are at counseling. And we start counseling people based on, on that uh, prideful idea. Man, you're in for a world of hurt. And the bad thing is with counseling is that you're not alone for that ride. You're going to take somebody with you. You're going to uh, use your prideful, limited knowledge. And you're gonna really, you can really hurt some people. So these first two points are non-negotiable. If you are counseling or advising someone and not giving biblically sound counsel or you are not actively speak, seeking out and inviting the Holy Spirit into the counseling, don't call it biblical counseling. Uh, so these next points are not necessarily requirements. They're from my experience and from counseling sessions I've been a part of, and wisdom I've gotten from more experienced counselors, mostly the last one. And this next point, uh, and I just marginally put it below the first two, this is not gospel, but it's so close, so close, uh, is you don't, biblically, you don't counsel anyone of the opposite sex one-on-one. And it's so... Pastor Herb, Pastor Herb gave me much wisdom. And when I say Pastor Herb gave me much wisdom, it means he gave me very strong correction. And uh, the first time he ever told me, the first time he ever told me, I was, I was, I was counseling with a woman that, I, that came to me, asked for some help and some prayer and some guidance and some thought about a marriage situation. And he, he corrected me and I thought, man, that is really some, some 1950s thinking that a man can't counsel a woman Oh my gosh, what a, what a foolish, naive thing on my part. And I'm so glad that I had enough respect to listen to him uh, because that is a very, very dangerous situation. And I'll tell you, if, 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 we're in a prayer, if, we're in, if we're in a church service and we have a prayer time and a woman comes up and says, hey, can you pray for me? Absolutely, I'm going to pray for her. Absolutely. What I'm not going to do is I'm not going to say, oh yeah, here, let's, let's step into this room where, we're, where, it's, where it's private and we can talk and pray. I'm not going to do that. You see a difference there? Right? When... when it's not that I don't trust people, and it's not that I don't trust myself. It's that I don't trust the devil. And I know he plays dirty. And I know he's playing for keeps, and I know he's not going to make it easy on anybody. So when somebody's looking for counseling, they're already uh, vulnerable, emotional, all these things. You putting yourself into that situation is just asking for trouble, honestly. It's just asking for trouble. Now, I'll say, man, there's times when maybe the Holy Spirit's going to guide and direct you to do that. Man, check that twice because it's, it's a very dangerous situation. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says, Abstain from all appearance of evil. And definitely, if you are going around meeting with a member of the opposite sex one-on-one, you definitely are, are presenting the appearance of evil. Uh, and these next points are helpful, but I think they're much less concrete. These are things that, uh, as the Holy Spirit directs, these are areas that we can really, really drift from. But these are just things that I found, found helpful for myself. Um, every prolonged counseling arrangement should have a clear goal. And it's amazing. You say something like that, and you think, well, yeah, that makes sense. But a lot of times people will counsel for a long time with somebody only to realize that they both had a different end goal in mind. The counselor and the person they're counseling each had a different end goal. We didn't get on the same page. If you're talking to a close friend or you're just sitting down a few times to help them reason through some things, uh, then it's not really necessarily necessary to talk about your end goal. But if it goes beyond like four regular sessions, it's helpful to have a clear goal and a finish line to the counseling. Um, you can set small goals as well. Like we're going to work towards this. And when we achieve that, we can work towards this. You can set it up different ways um, but have a goal. Have something you're both working towards together. This is usually, if we go beyond four regular sessions, this is a lot of time where I'll, where I'll bring up the idea of a, of a um, counseling agreement, which we talked about a little bit last week. 
And this doesn't mean the goal can't change or be edited, but it's immensely helpful to know you're both working on the same thing. Counseling becomes very unproductive when you're working on different goals. Uh, Pray and seek God's wisdom together. When you're setting the goal for your counseling, pray and seek God's wisdom together. Let him guide and direct the direction that you're heading right from the very beginning. Don't, Don't make your plans and then pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help you with your plans. Bring him in at the beginning and he makes the plans. Uh, If you're counseling someone, oh, counseling sessions focus on the person at the session. This is a big one as well. If you're counseling someone on their marriage and their spouse is unwilling to come or unable to attend a session, the focus of the session becomes about the person that's there. And we stick with their actions, their reactions, their behaviors, their thoughts. If you have a counseling session and 80% of the counseling session is talking about somebody that isn't there, you're gossiping, you're not counseling. I hate to think that there are people that are sitting down and having meetings about things I've said and things I've done where I'm not there to maybe correct some some incorrect assumptions or correct what they might be saying. So all counseling is directly about the person that's in the counseling. It, It doesn't matter if the last session you were in the middle of talking about something with them and someone else. If the other person doesn't come to the counseling session, you immediately switch gears and your counseling is strictly on what they're doing, strictly on what they're saying, strictly on their thinking, strictly on on the words coming out of their mouth. Set and keep, set, uh, set times and keep them. Set the frequency that you will meet, set the time and place you will meet, set how long you will meet each time. You value their time and show your commitment to them by showing up on time and communicating with them When you need to cancel or reschedule, they value your time by showing up on time, by keeping to a scheduled meeting duration, and by communicating with you when they need to cancel or reschedule. All of this flies out the window when the Holy Spirit directs otherwise, obviously. And this can be tough. Um, Sometimes people that you're counseling become time and energy vacuums. And it's not intentional. It's people that are legitimately seeking out help, but they will just eat up all of your time, all of your energy, and it can become a very unhealthy relationship, even if it's not on your end, on their end, where you have now become, they've become dependent on you, and that is exactly the opposite of what Christian counseling should be doing. We should be pointing them back to Jesus as their Savior, Jesus as the answer to their problems. God is the one that is going to deal with this situation, but if we're not careful, we can create an unhealthy arrangement with a person that they're looking to us as being their savior, looking to us as being the source of the wisdom and knowledge that they need in their life, rather than getting them to start looking towards God, getting them to start talking to the Holy Spirit, trying to bring the Holy Spirit into their life, active in their life, to help guide and direct them like like the Holy Spirit does for us. That's our goal, to not get them to rely on us. And again, that plays into our human ego when they start relying on us, as, oh, you, your, your advice is so good and you, you, you know so much about what you're talking about. Man, you just got to be careful. When they start putting the butter on thick, you need to be very careful that make sure that you are giving all the glory, all the praise goes back to God. He's the one doing all the work. I'm just here to be his hand. That's all I'm here to do. So uh, we are going to stop our third session there. In our next session, we are going to continue with the, the practical how-to of counseling. And we will be right back in just a couple minutes.